Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really uh, delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, which is entitled, What is Different About Pediatrics? Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, the session today is going to comprise of a presentation followed by a short Q&A. So please do add all your Q&As to the Q&A um, area as we go through the session. Um, we actively encourage it and so we've got um, Professor Alfred Nicholson waiting uh, to eagerly answer your questions after his presentation. So the session comprises of a presentation followed by the short Q&A as I said, um, but I I am really very pleased to introduce you today to our speaker, who is Professor Alf Nicholson, who is the RCSI Bahrain Head of School and Vice President for Academic Affairs and Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics in Dublin, Ireland and Dean of Postgraduate Training. But that's not all. Um, so just a little bit of a background about Professor Nicholson, who qualified in Dublin and began his training in pediatrics. Um, there was further postgraduate training in Manchester in the UK and a three year fellowship in pediatrics in the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. So he's very well travelled. Having returned to Ireland, uh, Professor Nicholson held consultant professions, uh, positions, apologies, in Malingua and Drahida prior to, and I'm sure I've pronounced those really badly wrongly, um, no prior to taking up the position of RCSI Professor of Pediatrics and Head of Department in 2008. He's had many national and international leadership roles, including Executive Member of the European Academy of Pediatrics for 12 years, the National Clinical Lead for Pediatrics and neonatology program for nine years and co-dean for both basic and higher specialist training programs in pediatrics for 18 years. During this period of time, Professor Nicholson developed a national model of care for pediatrics and neonatology, a national undergraduate curriculum and a new outcome-based curriculum for postgraduate training in pediatrics. He's the author of over 90 peer-reviewed articles, a pediatric reference textbook on common conditions in pediatrics and a parent information book, When Your Child is Sick, which has sold tens of thousands of copies and been translated into many different languages. We're also very, very excited to say that Professor Nicholson has just published a textbook of pediatrics entitled Building Blocks in Pediatrics, which you should be able to see on your screen right now on the left hand side, which published with Elsevier in September 2022. Um, his current role is as head of school and vice president for academic affairs in RCSI Bahrain, where he oversees the introduction of a new transformative undergraduate curriculum in the medical school. So I think that you'll agree with me that today you're in very good hands. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Nicholson. Thank you, Professor Nicholson. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to speak to you this evening uh, on behalf of both myself and so my co-editor, Professor Kevin Dunn, who also works here in Bahrain. As you can see, I'm well-traveled uh, and I've really enjoyed uh, a long uh, career in pediatrics. So I thought what I might do is give a few reflections to you based on that experience of why it all began for me, uh, what attracted me to pediatrics, and in a sense, what is different about pediatrics. Uh, and of course, um, there are many differences that, that pediatrics brings up. I think the chief among them is, uh, is the fact that as a student or as a postgrad, you're taking a history from a third party, usually one of the parents, not from the mother. And the second thing is that children never stay the same. Uh, they're growing and developing all the time. And, and I think one of the great attractions to me to pediatrics is both that aspect, which is the growth and development, which is fascinating. And also the fact that by and large, uh, children tend to recover completely and quickly from acute illness. Next slide, please, Darren. So I, I think the burning question for many of you who might be interested in pursuing a career in pediatrics or who are about to start or, or have just finished your pediatric rotation as an undergraduate, is how, how come after a very, a very short period, just six weeks, you can actually become hooked uh, on a potential career in pediatrics? And I can only give you my experience. And I, I think the first thing for me was 
a very inspiring professor and team who really, um, I think were very good teachers, uh, were very clearly inspiring people and who taught pediatrics extremely well while I was in Dublin. And I think the second reason was probably a more personal one, which was when I was growing up uh, through primary school and through secondary school into university, my best friend was um, a young guy called Tommy and he went into med school with me, but he had congenital heart disease, a condition called Fallows Tetralogy, whereby he was blue at birth and uh, he was quite often blue thereafter. He had an operation in London, the Great Ormond Street, but I th sadly he passed when he was 19 years of age in our first year of medical school. And I think that kind of uh, stayed with me. And I think uh, it is ironic to think that what's different now is that if you were to be born in 2022 with Fallows Tetralogy, you'd have about a 98, 99% chance of reaching adult life. So it's, it's a very different world for children and a very much better world for the great majority of children, at least in well-off countries right now. So next slide, please, Debbie. Um, I think you've heard my own career uh, in relation to where I've been. I, I think one thing I would strike uh, as an important element of a career in healthcare, and particularly a career in pediatrics, is uh, maintaining that work-life balance. Luckily, uh, I happen to be married and have four healthy children. Uh, and there's, there's no doubt that uh, people have often asked me, is it a great advantage to be a, uh, or to have a pediatrician in the household when you've got small children or who may become unwell or get become injured at times? I think that my children would probably say uh, that in that sense, um, I tend to downplay minor illnesses that they had, and I tend to kind of not ignore them, but uh, certainly uh, not be as sympathetic as I perhaps should be uh, for minor illnesses, because I was seeing such major illness in the hospital, and I knew the differentiation. But I, I think the most important thing about a career in pediatrics, which is demanding, both emotionally and physically, is that you need to maintain that balance between your work life and your home life, and protect uh, your home life through added interest, through mindfulness and through other mechanisms uh, to reduce the stress, be stress because burnout is a, is a real issue amongst the healthcare professionals and, all, and certainly amongst pediatricians. Next slide, please, Darren. I, I think uh, just thinking about what is different now from before, uh, this um, is a famous painting uh, from the Tate Gallery in London uh, from the 19th century, showing a very concerned doctor uh, with his, uh, you know, looking very carefully and very quizzically at a young sick child, uh, an exhausted mother who's uh, not far away and a slightly disinterested dad. And, and I think that one of the key things here is that um, almost all healthcare to children uh, took place in a home setting. And children uh, largely got infectious illnesses and if they were to become extremely unwell, it was through infectious illness that they became unwell. So this young child uh, had measles and was extremely unwell. And the doctor had very little at his disposal. Uh, but the key thing that he had was a, a very significant experience in dealing with measles in the home setting. And also the ability to come back and forth to the home to see how the child was doing. I think that happily this child made a full recovery. Uh, and uh, this picture just highlights um, what pediatrics would have been like over 100 years ago. So if we just move on to the next slide, I can tell you what pediatrics is quite like now. Uh, now, as you can see from these slides, pediatrics is quite intense, is very often hospital based, still focuses, as you can see in the top left corner, on clinical skills. And I'm not sure if you can see through, uh, uh, it's multicultural. So there are many children in all of our uh, all countries from different uh, cultures and different origins. Uh, they may be asylum seekers. Uh, they, most countries have a multicultural element to them. And these children um, and their families may react differently to illness and they may have different illnesses. So I think that the key difference of modern pediatrics is that sick children tend to quickly uh, move to hospital. And therefore that, that puts a, a lot of stress and strain on the hospital system. 
Now, during the COVID pandemic, pediatric hospitals were relatively quiet. But during this winter, uh, as you may be aware if you are in training already, uh, hospitals have become extremely busy in terms of pediatric hospitals with RSV and other viral illnesses. And it's become very, very demanding and very, very stressful for the staff. Next slide, please, Deborah. I think um, when I reflect on a uh, career in pediatrics, I, I reflect on the, this publication, which came out in 2016, in relation to what has been termed the seven great achievements in pediatric research over the past 40 years. Because we do know that today's research is really tomorrow's standard of care. And I think the key elements, uh, and I think first and foremost, is through vaccination, that infections have greatly reduced amongst children. The other thing that's reduced, and I think it was through uh, the media and through Anne Diamond in particular, uh, the Back to Sleep campaign, which she spearheaded in the United Kingdom, uh, led to a significant reduction in cot death, which was the major killer in infancy uh, some years ago. The other big difference is in acute lymphatic leukemia, or, or ALL, where now we can expect an over 90% cure rate with personalized treatment, with clinical trials, whereby each child undergoing treatment for leukemia is treated exactly the same way and is always placed in clinical trial. You may not fully see this, but the, the greatly improved survival of markedly preterm infants. Um, prematurity uh, is such now that uh, children, babies and infants are up under you know, 26 weeks and down to about 23, 24 weeks are quite capable of intact survival, which is a huge change from 10 or 15 years ago. Worldwide, one of the great advances is preventing HIV infection and transmission from mother to baby. And certainly in most Western European countries, uh, there's virtually no, no HIV transmission from mother to infant in utero. Cystic fibrosis is a very common condition across the world, but particularly in Northern Europe and the United States and Australia. And nowadays, uh, because of genetic treatment and because of newborn screening, cystic fibrosis is a condition where uh, the life expectancy has increased to the mid to late 40s and maybe even higher. And I think one of my own uh, pet uh, subjects is, is car safety and in fact child safety in general. And I think um, there's no doubt that we have saved many, many, many lives through use of seat belts and car seats. Uh, and the pediatricians have been very powerful advocates for improved car safety across the world. The so next slide, please, Deborah. So um, just to sort of give you a synopsis of those key changes in pediatrics, um, of course, we've seen improved standards of living. Uh, we've also seen many killer uh, illnesses or killer diseases, mainly infections that have disappeared. Uh, I remember when I was in Melbourne, we used to see a case of epiglottitis, which was a very rare um, but serious illness where a child would uh, certainly have very significant breathing distress and could die. Uh, due to hemophilus disease, and that's now virtually disappeared. We've seen a major surge in allergic disease, uh, and there are lots of theories behind that, but it's certainly in most uh, well-off countries, at least 5 to 10% of uh, children have a significant allergic disease. Many children who used not survive are living on with chronic and complex disability, and we found that that's more prevalent. And there's no doubt that managing these um, children is really, really important in terms of giving them a, a very strong outpatient service, but also ensuring that if they become unwell, that there's a specialized service that they can avail of. Now, the other big issue is, of course, that emotional behavioral problems and indeed in adolescence, anxiety and depression now affect a significant proportion of the child and adolescent population. And then the other big change is, of course, changes in parental expectation. Parents expect full recovery in their children. And some of them, uh, I think unwisely, have lost confidence in primary care provision and are very keen to seek access to specialist care. And through the internet, uh, they have become what we call an informed client group. So that when they come with a symptom, they've already gone uh, to the internet and they may have become extremely anxious by this trolling that they tend to do, uh, looking for possible answers to their child's symptoms. Next uh, slide, please, Deborah. 
Um, one of the other great things that I, struck me as I went through a career in healthcare is, uh, and this is a very difficult thing to do as a healthcare professional, is uh, always try and see it from a patient's perspective. And when we were designing models uh, for uh, various care pathways for children, uh, the group that really were most important to us uh, and direct us always in the right direction were the parent advocacy groups because they knew, uh, let's say their child was diabetic or had cystic fibrosis, they knew exactly what their lived experience was and learning from that lived experience and designing a healthcare system that suits their needs and is in their best interests is the most important way of designing uh, any service for young children. Next slide, please, Devin. I think the other thing that I learned throughout a career in healthcare, particularly relating to children, is that we should always aim for health and not care. So that rather than treating a child with a particular condition, we should always seek to prevent it. And there are some examples here uh, of very successful mechanisms of pre prevention. Breastfeeding, we know, is uh, very protective to young infants and, and young children and has many beneficial effects. Um, folic acid fortified flour uh, will prevent uh, the onset of neural tube defects in pregnancies. Vitamin D is a really important vitamin uh, and we do recommend that infants receive vitamin D supplementation uh, to ensure that they don't become vitamin D deficient. We now do what we call heel prick testing uh, in all newborns. Uh, it used to be for about six to eight and inborn errors of metabolism, also hypothyroidism, but has now been extended to cystic fibrosis and an ever increasing uh, range of conditions whereby early diagnosis will lead to a successful cure. Now, there are one such condition um, uh, that can, we will be screened for, I think, in the future is uh, spinal muscle atrophy, which is a very rare condition causing babies to be very floppy. And indeed, the condition that I got uh, as a final year medical student in my examination in pediatrics. But these little babies, uh, if given uh, specific gene therapy soon after birth, can have quite a normal life. Uh, so that the goalposts have changed dramatically uh, for treating many conditions that were hitherto difficult uh, to diagnose uh, and often uh, with a poor outcome. Hip ultrasound screening. Uh, we know now that in most countries that people who've got risk factors uh, have hip ultrasound screening, and this picks up developmental dysplasia of the hip or uh, a dislocated hip. Very important to pick this up. Can be difficult to pick it up clinically, and ultrasound screening is very, very helpful. And then, of course, uh, the antenatal heart ultrasound scan. So almost all babies now have you know, this anomaly scanning at around 20 weeks gestation, looking for, amongst other things, congenital heart disease. And if a little baby happens to have a significant congenital heart disease problem, they see a cardiologist who advises them further and they're born adjacent to or in a hospital where a tertiary pediatric cardiology service is available. So there are no major shocks after birth and there's a baby is immediately stabilized and transferred to intensive care and has a, almost always a successful operation and a good outcome. But I think the other things that have happened over the past while, as I did mention before, are um, the prevention of cot death through the Back to Sleep campaign the use of vaccines, uh, universal hearing screening so that young children who have congenital deafness actually go to normal school uh, and are well able to attain normal academic uh, uh, outputs, which is fantastic. Uh, obesity is still a big problem in many countries uh, with very high rates of obesity in most Western countries. But uh, happily in the Nordic countries of Sweden, Norway and Denmark, uh, the obesity tide has started to turn uh, because of sugar taxes and a significant ban on advertising of unhealthy foods. I'm going to talk a little bit about adolescent health in a short while. And again, I mentioned injuries that are really important to prevent both pedestrian injuries, where the speed of the car is the key issue in relation to injuries in the child, and the successful restraint of car passengers, particularly children, in the back of the car. And next slide, please, Deb. Thank you, Deborah. So um, type 1 diabetes is a very important condition, um, an increased prevalence condition. And we know that uh, good diabetic control with the HbA1c level 
less than 7.5 is difficult to attain, but if you attain good diabetic control, you significantly reduce the risk of complications. Now, diabetes um, is difficult to manage and should be managed by a specialist service. Um, obviously, there are key education elements of the significant change uh, for a family. Uh, and nowadays, we've moved to continuous glucose monitoring and also uh, insulin pump therapy. And I think that both have been revolutionary, really, in terms of treating diabetes. But it is still a significant diagnosis. And many families do find it extremely difficult when uh, one of their children has di been diagnosed having type 1 diabetes. It, it's a huge impact on the whole family and on the child themselves. Next, next slide, please, Gemma. Um, just to give you a flavour of what it might be like if you were in a maternity hospital uh, or in a, a large neonatal unit and you were called to a delivery of a tiny preterm baby. The key elements that are important in managing the tiny newborn infant are, of course, a very skilled team of both nurses and doctors to resuscitate the baby uh, gently uh, and to keep the baby warm. As you can see, this baby has got a a cellophane um, uh, bag, polyurethane bag, just to keep the baby warm and has very skilled resuscitation by um, a senior person. So that resuscitation, uh, the keeping the baby warm and transferring the baby to a neonatal intensive care unit where a very skilled team of both neonatologists and nurses uh, and clinical nurse specialists will look after the infant. And again, with that process and with newborn transport, mechanisms whereby if the baby is born in a hospital without these facilities they can be transferred safely or picked up from a tertiary unit has transformed both uh, the morbidity and indeed the mortality of very tiny premature babies where the outcomes now are really excellent. Next slide please Sarah. So um, what do we think about adolescence? Uh, well adolescence is um, uh, defined as a period um, of which now can extend debatably from around 10 to 12 years of age to about 24, uh, where um, I think there are unique health challenges. There are unique challenges uh, for the young person. And uh, there's no doubt uh, that in this age group, people do take risks and have risk-taking behaviors. I think one of the key issues if you're interviewing an adolescent is the issue of confidentiality. And uh, there are certain key mechanisms and uh, methods by which we interview successfully adolescents with their parents and then perhaps on their own confidentially. I think there is a very high percentage, certainly over 10% uh, of adolescents who experience significant anxiety and often depression. Um, eating disorders tend to become evident during adolescence and are difficult to treat, uh, but do require specialist attention. And there is an ever increasing uh, prevalence of deliberate self-harm amongst adolescents, and also an increased prevalence of chronic disabling fatigue. Uh, adolescents are more prone to injury. And I think one of the key issues for adolescents, if they've got a chronic condition, is how we transition them and when we transition them and how we overlap with our adult colleagues in terms of giving them the best possible care. And that sensitive area of transition is really, really important to get right. So a young uh, pre-adolescent diabetic who wants to transition to the adult services, just getting the timing right and having uh, co-clinics for a period of time till the family and the child themselves and the adolescent themselves are comfortable moving to the adult service. Next slide, please. Um, I think uh, yes, nobody would have predicted a pandemic um, but new pandemics are always a possibility. Uh, I think we need to train uh, for the future because we know that um, in terms of medical knowledge, uh, in the past, medical knowledge used to take maybe 10 to 20 years for it to double. And now we know that the, the new medical knowledge uh, doubles every 73 days. So it's a, it's a matter of months uh, before you're out of date again. So uh, I think... Um, a closed loop bionic pancreas for type 1 diabetes is not that far away. I think uh, many babies, for lots of good reasons, mainly in terms of genetic treatments uh, and our possibilities, may have their gene code mapped at birth. 
Uh, we are making strides in terms of desensitization in children's disease. Uh, when you add asthma, eczema, food allergies, and allergic rhinitis together, somewhere of the order of 25% of the childhood population have atopic disease. I've mentioned before gene therapy for cystic fibrosis, which is really important and has really changed the landscape and the outcomes for cystic fibrosis patients. There will be new vaccines potentially for RSV or bronchiolitis, group B strep, which is a serious bacterial illness in newborn babies, and hopefully worldwide for malaria. I think we're always doing more screening. And I think I mentioned hearing screening, DDH screening, and heart screening. Uh, but I think that as treatments become more available uh, and where early treatment is at a premium, it, it is much more likely that we're going to have more screening rather than less screening. And as I mentioned, um, we don't know what the next pandemic might be. Uh, we hope it won't be. Uh, it will be certainly a long time. Perhaps the last pandemic, world pandemic, was in 1918, um, just after the uh, First World War. So that it was almost 100 years ago. That, but hopefully uh, we won't have one very soon. But it's always a likely possibility uh, that we'll have a, a further pandemic uh, to tackle uh, over the near, medium to near future. Next slide, please. I think, uh, just think about if you were to enter pediatrics um, as a career, um, I think, uh, think about the way parental expectations have changed, how the demographics in the Western world have changed, how technology has changed everything that we do and how the economy has changed. Um, I think most people will, will want um, care closer to home. And I think that's the best way to deliver care will want integrated care. They would like to be less in a hospital and more at home, as I mentioned. And people who work in hospitals and indeed in the community are likely to require to be seven day workers. Uh, and I think in view of that, uh, we need to change our workforce. Therefore, we need to be a flexible workforce, a more consultant led workforce, a workforce that really spans both the hospital and the community uh, where hospital teams reach out into the community and are working very closely with their family practitioner colleagues. And we'd like to uh, think about uh, multi-professional working and multi-professional training. So not training people in silos, so health and social care professionals, nurses and doctors all being trained uh, with uh, interprofessional learning amongst them. And I think that uh, we need to train staff in the right numbers so obviously we need to have a, a workforce um, plan in terms of how many pediatricians are needed uh, to run a service for a particular population based on my, uh, bearing in mind the uh, changing demographics. Next slide, please. So I mentioned at the start, and I, I would like to re-emphasize this, um, there are some personality traits that may lead to burnout. Uh, uh, I think the key avoidance factor is, is to become a team player uh, and to change roles throughout your career. And I think that happily I've successfully done that. And I think that uh, teaching undergraduates and postgraduate students is to me the most important element of the career development or has been for me at least a really important element that say he who dares to teach but never cease to learn. And, and I think um, that one motto that I've kept with throughout my career in paediatrics. And next slide, please. Um, I think uh, uh, what we've tried to do with this book uh, is to share both Kevin Dunn and I, our combined knowledge and our experience uh, to place it into a textbook that takes the reader, um, a, a student or, or a postgrad, uh, from the core basis of the pediatrics, right through all the different symptoms the child may present with, uh, to pediatrics in everyday practice, and then to the specialist areas that are important, uh, such as how to conduct a clinic and how to research the literature, how to um, interpret investigations, and how, how to be both ethical and professional at all times. So I think sharing your knowledge, and it is the only way to achieve immortality. So I think if you're uh, planning a career in any health um, area, I think being available to students, to mentor students, and to mentor young graduates 
is a key element uh, that both benefits you and certainly benefits them. So thank you for your attention. Um, I would be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and thank you to Deborah for going through the slides so seamlessly. <laughs> thank you, Professor Nicholson. And I just wanted to say uh, really massive thank you for for the webinar. It was so informative and, um, you know, covered such a lot in, in such a short space of time. So we really appreciate your time. Um, we do have some uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, so, um, but uh, people on the line, please do feel free to add your questions as we're going along. So um, you mentioned third party history taking. Do you have any tips on this? I think you talked at the beginning about, you know, it's difficult because you have to talk to the parents to get an idea of, of symptoms, etc. with children. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the key um, difference uh, between um pediatrics um, and adult medicine. Of course, um, what you need to do is, uh, is gain the confidence of the parents uh, and listen very, very carefully to what they've got to say. And in many respects, um, you know, the key aspect of any history is really uh, presenting symptoms. So why the child has been brought to you on this particular day and what is the sequence of those symptoms can you itemize them and can they, you then detail them? Mm -hmm. And if you're, and you do struggle with that initially, but as you become more and more experienced, that becomes clearer and, and that clarity of the presenting symptoms enables you to make a very, very, very strong uh, sense of what the differential diagnosis should be. What I don't like uh, and what we don't like as the pediatricians and um, uh, even family doctors is, uh, to perhaps take a slightly less than full from history and or maybe not do a full examination and mm -hmm. to end up doing investigations to compensate for that. Now, firstly, investigations are not often popular, particularly blood tests with young children, uh, but also x-rays do contain radiation, CT scans do contain radiation, uh, and all these investigations should only be done if you can justify them and if you can sequence them in the right order. So I think the history is incredibly important. The examination is also incredibly important. And what you learn as an undergraduate is to be able to take the core histories for the common conditions that children may present with uh, and to do a proper examination of each of the systems so that you can confidently uh, generate a differential diagnosis and then to have a sense as to what the investigation might do to confirm that clinical impression. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, there's another question. How do you deal with the very difficult emotional nature of the role? Oh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, well, I, I, I did um, say before about um, having a good work-life balance, mm -hmm. and I think that's really, really important. Um, there is no doubt in the world, though, that one of the areas that can distress um, a young trainee in pediatrics is an event whereby a child becomes extremely unwell or, or doesn't, uh, has a bad outcome. Uh, because for the parents and for the family and for the community, that's a devastating thing. Uh, and nobody but, the, uh, you, but a, a no professional would not be affected by that. So I think that there are two elements to it. One is um, not to be afraid to show emotion mm -hmm. and not to be afraid to, re to recognize that this is difficult for you uh, and uh, to share your experiences. And we, during our training days with the trainees, we often had um, sessions where outcomes weren't perfect uh, and a trainee would present the case uh, and then would open it. We would open it for discussion and seek other people's experiences and share those experiences. I think in that safe environment, um, I think it's very, very healthy and very, very positive. Uh, and I think for me, um, I, I, I think it was, uh, I tended to cycle in and out to work. And when I got on my bike going home, I tended to leave it all behind me. I think making sure that you don't bring it home with you is really, really important. Uh, and I think that that's a learning skill. It's not something yeah. that perhaps everyone innately has, but it's a vital skill to be a successful pediatrician over a long period of time, I think. 
Yeah, that's really great advice. Thank you. Um, okay. What tips do you have for starting a career in paediatrics? Yeah, I think, well, there are lots of tips I could offer, but I think uh, the most important um, thing I could say is that you have to have a passion for paediatrics. And I think that it's very hard to know what lights that passion is very different for different people. Uh, but I think that generally, if you're lucky uh, and uh, if you meet um, during your undergraduate career, uh, perhaps an inspiring pediatrician or maybe you were treated by a pediatrician mm -hmm. as a young child um you might feel inspired to to go into pediatrics but when you um feel that it's the area that you're interested in i think it's really important to do well during your pediatric rotation to perhaps um meet up with the teaching team and say how interested you are in pediatrics possibly in the final uh, summer before you graduate mm -hmm. to do an elective in paediatrics uh, and then to, to what you call it, um, if you can, during your foundation year or intern year, as they would be in Ireland, uh, do some paediatrics during that time uh, and then apply for a, a basic specialist training slot in paediatrics, mm -hmm. which is usually two years. Uh, and then you go on to higher specialist training, which is often five years. Now in Europe, uh, in Western Europe, most paediatric training programs are five years in total. But in general, it's somewhere between five and seven years as a training program. And I think during that time in, in the UK and Ireland, you do examinations. Mm -hmm. In Europe, uh, it's much more log, log book and experientially based. But I think that both systems work very, very well. Uh, and uh, I think it's, as a training program, I think they're, they're generally very, very uh, sought after. So it is competitive. And therefore, mm -hmm. you do need to uh, do some research projects and maybe do an MD thesis, uh, but that's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is uh, that you um, increase sequentially your knowledge, uh, pass your examinations, uh, and uh, do an excellent job day to day, uh, and you'll certainly progress very swiftly and successfully through a pediatric postgraduate career. That's great. Thank you. Um, I saw, well, this is a bit controversial. Would you recommend a career in paediatrics? I mean, I guess oh. you've slightly covered that when you talked about well, I think, yeah, passion. I, th I think, uh, I, I, I suppose if there are um, 100 students in a, a particular undergraduate class anywhere in the world, um, it's likely that about five of them will do, go into paediatrics. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's about one in 20. Um, I think um, the key things for you to know about paediatrics, I think I've covered. But the most important thing, of course, is that um, that you you like dealing with children. Mm -hmm. You do not mind um, um, allaying the anxieties of extremely anxious parents, and they are very anxious at times. Yeah. Uh, you enjoy um, the cut and thrust of um, you know the day to day life as a paediatrician. Uh, a lot of it is uh, diagnostically sometimes challenging. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, children won't tell you what's wrong, so you have to work it out through a detailed history and, and a proper examination and the very judicious use of investigations. But what I've found is that because I'm dealing with children um, uh, all the time uh, and their families, um, and of course it does range from newborns, tiny premature mm -hmm. babies, all the way to adolescents. Uh, so it's very varied. You can choose a specialty that suits you, uh, you may be very interested in congenital heart disease and become yeah. uh, a pediatric cardiologist. You might love the idea of infectious diseases and their prevention and treatment and recognition and become an infectious disease specialist. So there are, you know, well over 30 subspecialties of pediatrics. I happen to stay mm -hmm. and be a general pediatrician because I like the challenge of um, diagnosing children and putting them in the right direction. So I, it never lost its appeal for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't uh, do active clinical work right at the moment um, because I'm in a, very much in a, a head of school role. But I, I, I do miss it. Uh, and I think that uh, the um, the nice aspects of paediatrics um, greatly outweigh any of the difficult aspects. Mm -hmm. I think some of the difficulties do relate to um, children with very complex care needs uh, uh, and very, very distressed parents. And also the occasional occurrence, which is uh, where a child has, or a, a family, there are safeguarding issues. 
mm-hmm. where a child may have had um, physical abuse or been injured by their parents. So that can be very challenging. Yeah. But again, with a highly professional approach, it can also be very rewarding. And so I, I, I find the whole package of pediatrics and I've always found it a very, very uh, interesting and extremely rewarding profession. Thank you. We do have a couple more questions. I think we probably have time and I would just um, ask any of our participants if you have any questions, any more questions rather, please do drop them in the chat now. Um, What is the most rewarding thing about working in paediatrics? It's another question we have here. Well, I I think the most rewarding thing is, um, and I suspect that uh, many pediatricians would probably say the same thing, is if you're working as a a newborn specialist or a neonatologist um, to be at a delivery of a very, very premature baby uh, and to be involved in that management process, to go through um, with the family um, all the trials and tribulations of being a very premature baby and, and all the reactions that they have to that and to see maybe up to four months later that little baby go home yeah. uh, and uh, be healthy and be well and perhaps maybe four to six years later uh, to see um, that uh, that young child uh, healthily going to school uh, and I, I think that's that's amazingly important so, mm-hmm. because there's there's very few areas in healthcare where you can have such a positive impact as in pediatrics. I, yeah. I think it's for that reason, it's, it's such a great um, specialty. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, there is one more question left, and this is definitely not a plant. Um, can you recommend any good resources to help learn about pediatrics? And I don't, I will just draw <laughs> your attention um, to the book on the left here. Um, yeah, well, I, I think there are. I, I think um, any resources, well, I, I think the key resource really is somebody who is actually training in pediatrics at the mm-hmm. moment or somebody who was one of your teachers, be they senior or less senior, uh, just ask them what they had to do, um, why they did it, uh, and what attracted them to the a career in pediatrics. And the other thing, of course, is that by their enthusiasm for the specialty, and a lot of pediatricians, I think, are very enthusiastic for their specialty, um, by that sheer enthusiasm, it tends to rub off on the students who are mm-hmm. in their, you know, under their super or who are being supervised by them. So I, I think that um, I can't think of any uh, other specialty that I would rather have been in. Uh, and I think in terms of finding out about it, obviously, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in the United Kingdom is a great mm-hmm. resource. Uh, the European Academy of Pediatrics across Europe is a great resource. The American Academy of Pediatrics in North America or the Australian um, College of Pediatrics in Australia. They're all, they're all excellent resources in terms of uh, what to expect in terms of the career in pediatrics. But what you get is unique to you uh, and is unique to the specialty uh, that you pursue uh, and where you mm-hmm. train. I was very lucky to train in the United Kingdom and in Australia and indeed in Ireland uh, and had fantastic mentors who are still friends to this day. Um, having, you know, we hope that uh, the textbook that we have just um, published uh, or is about to be published, Building Blocks, will reflect both that enthusiasm and that wisdom uh, and that what we call, and it is named, I think correctly, building you up from the very start, uh, Mm -hmm. the first seven chapters, right through being a a high-powered specialist in paediatrics, which is the last section. So I I think that um, um, there are lots of resources, but I think the most valuable resource would be to talk to somebody who clearly, by their day-to-day demeanor, uh, is enthusiastic about paediatrics, is a top-class paediatrician, and is somebody who you would love to emulate. So Mm -hmm. I think that would be the best way to do it. I think that's great advice. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to check, but um, or will the book be available online? Um, I will have to check that. I think it is most likely to be available online. I, I think it is. I think that it's key. probably going to be in December. So it's uh, it, there's a few. Um, I, I, I think I think the date is probably going to be on online. I think the ebook version is going to be available. I think in December, yeah. but that's only a few weeks away. Yeah, there should be an ebook version that is that you can purchase, but 
um, it is likely also that it would be on clinical key. So if any of your institutions have access to that platform, it's likely you'll be able to find it there. So um, if there are no more questions from the audience, it just really leaves me to say a huge thank you to you, Professor Nicholson, for your uh, hugely inspiring um, speech today, um, a presentation rather. Um, I know, you know, I almost feel like I want to retrain as a paediatrician, but I don't think they'd have me now. Um, well. <laughs> but uh, we really, really do appreciate you, it. Right. And um, I'm sure that everyone on the line has found that really inspiring and helpful. And, you know, lots of really great things that um, can be implemented. And so I also wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone on the line who joined us today and to let you know that the recording of this session will be sent to you via email in about a week's time so that um, you know you can listen and watch again at your leisure but thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you again Professor Nicholson we very much appreciate it thank you Deborah for thank all you. your help much thank appreciated. you everyone